Grandma used to pray, oh Lord, please save them from the evil snares and all the dangers that entangle. Yeah, though they walk in through the valley of the shadows, just prepare and make them fit for every battle because but I know they're bound to come and I know they're bound to fall. But in your bounty, Lord, preserve their beautiful home. Right. We still survive and offer grandma's prayers. Surrounded by the jungle and the lion's den. Tread light, cause these traps is inconspicuous. They hide right in plain sight. Thinking we don't see them when they linger. Look right beneath the surface. Then leave a trail of corpses. Crisis, prices, your life a disposable commodity. Like living in a fantasy condition to believe that the system even cares whether selling CDs or walking or driving or reading. Look, they don't even need a reason. It's just your breathing and being black. When it's such a pretty fall, a pretty fall, it don't seem like we've fallen at all, at all. It's just a GMO dream where things are never really what they seem. Please kill the violins, tell them just to play me something pretty. Cause this pretty city got me screaming bloody murder. So they got me screaming. This pretty city got me. Got me on some, look, get your hand up on my pocket, distraction, so lazy they use the same tactics, like kind them with some trinkets, just don't let them get to thinking, that light bulb gets a blinking, you know niggas and ideas, oh dear, my dear, my dear, you may not know me, but I know you very well, for sight, for sight, they say hindsight is 2020, well tell me something, we gotta see that history is on repeat, and maybe it takes a beat and a melody to speak a little louder than the message in the clouds, or the essence in the air i swear my god is just so clear that a system driven by fear can never give us nothing but more of the same things things oh when it's such a pretty fall a pretty fall it don't seem like we've fallen at all it's just a gmo dream where things are never really what they seem please cue the violins tell them just to play me something pretty because this gritty city got me screaming it's murder Got me screaming, got me. This gritty city got me, got me on song. Wretched of the earth and my baptism And what happened next came in flashing visions Cause Malcolm blessed me from the order born With his infinite wisdom And I'll be to read his version of the 23rd song from his prison As Chad was wrapped in a robe the color of crimson Reading from the making of a new man Speaking with so much conviction I just sat there and listened And out of darkness came Marcus in an instant Who spoke of autonomy from the system Breaking down the tenets of dependency and its symptoms And I was on bending knee when Satan tempted me And the page of Anthony entered me mentally Like a form of hypnotherapy And somehow the last poets were sent to me and blew the revolutionary breath in me from then i knew it was my destiny to definitely fight to the death of me or eventually make the american hegemony a distant memory <laughs> Like how I feel when I hear another cop was shot When American soldier was dropped Sometimes this is all we got Raw hip-hop, uncooked, like unchopped as I crept through the shadow of death, holding my breath, my heart pounding in my chest, with no time to rest, watching my steps, carrying the weight of the oppressed, battling both the right and the left, till my thirst for freedom was without questions quenched. I did feel peaceful, till I saw Philly first over the easel, paint a path, he told me to follow it, no matter where it leads to, then Bethan says descend it, to remind me what greed do, he showed me the tree of life, told me to tend it, and it will forever feed you, that's when Desalene handed me my first axe, told me perfect my hacks, and in the face of evil, so in fact never 
would be peaceful. Then I heard a spark in my mind from Dr. Clark to remind that truth to the deceitful is so lethal they'll do everything to defeat you. Which is when I saw Huey holding the Uzi and he said he'd choose me, but he told me to keep up because he didn't want to lose me. Then Harriet with a rifle and a chariot spoke about the revolution, persisted I must marry it, handed me a torch and insisted I must carry it. Like how I feel when I hear another cop was shot When American soldier was dropped Sometimes this is all we got Bro, hip-hop, uncooked, unchopped I woke to Tupac rhyming over Bar Marley Jam Master J was looping, burning and looting The sounds penetrated my body And underneath it was a rebel yell of Adele My heart started to swell Cause also no history will absorb him As time will tell Then I saw a Sata in a gold pop that Surrounded by Cuban rosters Spraying the bata With Don Rafa, both doctors Had the same understanding of La Raza the people abused by coppers, flooded with drugs from mobsters. Kids who can't sleep because they're choppers. And Oscar Lopez suddenly appeared free to further focus on the hopeless. The dope heads and broke heads dressed in protest. And he was with Mumia. And they were both running in the spirit of a Libra. Passing out money and Nia to both agree as the non believers. And they said, Toma. And I took it. And this took me to La Isla Mona. Where I heard the war cry, Ana Cajona. Solo Lita. And I said, Doña. I'm so vexed and so stressed. My tensions are best. But I'm really confused about what I should do next. And she said, Do right. Do take some time to digest all the things you have on your chest And remember to always remain blessed Cause you can't walk on water if your mind is not at its best In order to take up the plight of the oppressed And usher in the fall of the West It's a feeling like I can't stop, 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 stop,
she's actually the author of five books, um, three which were which are recently published. Uh, Some of us are brave. Conversations with Sisters in Life, Art and Struggle is a two volume set published in October 2023 and in, in January 2024. Um, and what we stood for, the story of revolutionary black women co-written by Deborah Jones. And if you're not familiar with Deborah Jones, she is uh, someone that you probably heard a story before, but you might not know her name because that's how it be sometimes. She is. Um, Deborah Jones is uh, this story, first of all, is about the aftermath of a horrific incident that occurred Mother's Day weekend, 1970. Deborah is the woman who testified against Maulana Karanga, known as the creator of Kwanzaa, which resulted in him serving a four year prison sentence for, the, for torture in, seven, in 1975. Um, Deborah's story and that of the other woman who was tortured, Gail Davis, are always refer- referenced in relation to Karanga, Kwanzaa, and the US organization, but few people ever say their names. Now, for the first time outside of the courtroom, Deborah's story must be told. So this is a story that is written um, by Deborah and also our guest, Tanda Sizwe Chimaranga. Um, today, we're going to start off. We, we I don't know if y'all, y'all know anything about this, but we start off talking our shit because that's what we do. You know what I'm saying? That's how we do. That's how we've always done. I think the first time I met her, she started talking shit to me. But anyway. <laughs> We're going to talk about cultural nationalism versus revolutionary nationalism. I'm going to bring her on in a second. I need to get hyped up. We had the welfare poets. I got another video. I'm going to give you all real quick. This one's a lot shorter. It's called The People by My Family Vintage Tux. And if you watch close enough, you might see a cameo. Here we go. Douglas bro, motherfuckers with the muscles, no strength is in the digits, quit spitting on the bungalow. The devil got a buzz stronger than the bumble nose, lions and impalas, and they creeping through the jungle slow. Ward dog pull him over, but the tail light heart beating fast, and he begging to the jail price. You know the one that brother's find in the slammer, gotta do the running man if they ever find a hammer. Check the grammar. Kelsey ain't Frazier, sitting on the couch with his wrist near a razor. The hood could be good if we love thy neighbor, but the world is so cold, no gas in the pacer. Indiana in the temple of doom, no the slum ain't plum, it resembles a broom. Crime on the regular, look at the coons, is what they do from the treetop, silver for the spoon. No regrets, bro, we do it for the... Don't flex, bro, we do it for the... No rest, bro, we do it for the... No need to guess, bro, we do it for the... No regrets, bro, we do it for the... Don't flex, bro, we do it for the... No rest, bro, we do it for the... No need to guess, bro, we do it for the... Formerly, no, my Malcolm Little, but grow up in the my Malcolm unknown. AP like Malcolm Middle, but figure how sun grown is more corner stores, corner pockets, and blunt rolls. Get the rolling trips, and you know the grip, like run those. Live from where they designated for us to be at, with designated drivers. To stay behind on a G-Pack Toss money with lost money Inspired feedback And the light come with it, baby You see that? See that? Be that like nobody ever was They told us to get it forever On these forever bronze they Said to never be done The height of ambition is what you leak from And suck all that away when you get it Know who to keep from I'm riding in Tommy Smith, John Carlos but My jeans are still fit from John Favardos And I still do mean biz As far as bars go And my roof is still nowhere near Where my car goes Go for real. No regrets, bro, we do it for the Don't flex, bro, we do it for the No rest, bro, we do it for the No need to guess, bro, we do it for the No regrets, bro, we do it for the Don't flex, bro, we do it for the No rest, bro, we do it for the No need to guess, bro, we do it for the I'm not the big, you got to make a decision The people are going to have to stand up against the big That's what the battle is doing
What's happening? What's happening? How y'all feel out there? We're in the building. Tandy's in the building. She like she was getting low on the music over there. I guess that's what it was. You know what I mean? <laughs> we talk Just, so much stuff. Oh my immediately. god! Immediately, we don't even when you give them a break. We don't even let them breathe. They're not ready for it, Tandy. Listen. Um, for folks who just listen to the music, I know that um, normally I don't spend that much time with the intros and the music and all that type stuff. I want to shout out Sonny Patterson with the official intro. Um, for folks that don't know, um, definitely check her. Um, also, the second joint that you heard, again, was the Welfare Poets. I got that feeling. The third piece that you just heard was Vintage Tux and my man Sky Zoo. That's a joint we did right here in Atlanta. And I'm saying all that because FTP 20, the 20 year anniversary of FTP will be taking place. The hip hop martial arts and activism conference will be taking place during black August right here in Atlanta. And that's going to be Marcus Garvey weekend. So make sure we're going to have the heaviest organizers, freedom fighters, revolutionaries. We get down It's 20 years. Folks try to act like they don't know. But you can act like you don't if you don't want to decide with us because we're going to be here. Tandy, what's happening, my sister? How you doing, my so-called brother? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm like, we, we, what lies you done told on me today? When what we you mean? I was talking stuff. What I say? You don't even remember what I said. What? Oh, <laughs> during Black August uh, 20 years ago? <laughs> like, what did you, see, you, you don't even remember what you said. When exactly. I sent you the picture. I check you on it. What are you talking about? Exactly. That's why I'm, I'm going to win. I remember Yuri Kochiyama was there. Shout out to Yuri. You know what I'm saying? OG Shaka was there. Shout out to Shaka. OG Kamasi was there. Shout out to him and a whole bunch of other folks that was representing. And you and I'm gonna give it to I'm gonna give it to my sister Tandy. To this day, one of the illest, and I don't even know if I can say illest, but one of the illest libations that I had ever heard, especially at that time. Tandy did it, and she was like, I was like, man, who is this sister? Then I came up to her, I was like, good stuff. She's like. I know. Now you're lying. You're lying now. You know that right. <laughs> okay, I made that up. But I anyway, yeah, yeah exactly. I, I tried it. But you don't remember. So what you talking about? No! I said you picture the other day. You hugging up on them two brothers. You didn't even know who you was hugging. Now that is true. <laughs> exactly. Don't make me find it, put it up on the screen. They, they, they'll be looking at you differently. Don't go find it, brother. Like, oh, brother. Don't I told <laughs> you I'll pay you to delete that. Why you ain't deleting? Oh, that? well, let me throw that cash up over there. Dollar sign Kalanji Changa. You you get it? <laughs> if I don't hear this ding before it's over, you know what I mean? We'll play about that moolah. Anyway, shout out to all the folks who are checking us out on a Friday. This is Friday. It's rush hour in some places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's 4 p.m. Eastern. Tiny's on the West Coast. They still sleep over there, but it's all mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. Shout out to the West. What's good, though, Tiny? How you been? Man, I've been I've been working like they... I feel like I've been on a chain game, but uh, I'm... Uh... <laughs> I done got one of them ankles loose, so you know. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna hobble away. If I can't run, I'm gonna hobble. I'm gonna do something. So you like Harriet Thugman, huh? You halfway there. I'm halfway there. <laughs> halfway you know you got to get it. So there you, you know. Glad these books are out. You know, that's that's a big weight that's been lifted. So that's cool. I'm glad they're out too, because you've been talking about them. I was like, you know, I thought you, you know, everybody tell me they got a book these days. I'm like, Tony ain't got no now, damn brother, book. I see. There you go. There. <laughs> it's all right. It's love though. I see how I mean, you do. I see Come on, how, you, how many people could talk to you like this, Tandy? It, 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 I see how you do. It's all good. It's love. You call me your so-called brother, so my feelings was hurt. I had to catch up. But anyway, <laughs> um, today, <laughs> before, before we get started on the books, because the books are absolutely necessary, we got a topic that we're talking about, cultural nationalism versus revolutionary nationalism. You know that? That that causes a frenzy, an I uproar. Know. Yeah, I, I'm surprised yeah. that you, you said some of us are brave. You you right. You know, what I'm saying? well, some of us. I mean, I don't really see what the what the issue is and why people are afraid. So yeah, some of us are. What you scared for? What ain't nothing gonna happen? Okay, <laughs> what, what you gonna gonna happen? What's happening? Right on, right on. But you let, know, the reason let, why I, I suggested that is because Deborah's story, like you alluded to or, or mentioned in your intro, it just brings up so much. You know, people disdain African, well, at least here on the West Coast, let me put it that way. It's been my experience that people disdain uh, a return to African culture, uh, its utility, its importance, its sacredness, and they use 
what happened to Bunchy and John, which was horrific. Don't let anyone lie and try and say that I'm not saying it was not horrific, that it was not a tragedy. But they try to use that and what happened to Deborah as an axe to grind against all manifestations of African culture in our liberation struggle. Mm -hmm. And so we'll talk about, uh, like I mentioned to you before, they, you know, I got you got people running around out here who was maybe their parents weren't even a gleam in somebody's eye back in the day talking about a pork chop nationalist. What do you, do you even know what that word means? I didn't know what it meant because when I looked it up on the internet, I could see a Huey reference to it, but it didn't talk about what it meant. So shout out to Baba Daruba Ben Wahad, brother Baba Daruba, who was accessible and sure. allowed me to call him up. And I asked him straight up. So what did y'all mean by this? Because I don't understand people throwing around the word and they don't even explain it. That's right. You no, know, they don't know what they're talking about. So, you know, what's what is all this madness that is being thrown about out here? Yeah. Give us that definition, because we know whenever we got, you know, you already know Drew and I go back like we left something. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? L literally, I got a bad back right now because of him. I ain't gonna get into why. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Neck messed up, everything, but I ain't gonna get into why. But anyway, That's give us show. that. That's that's definitely for another, and we will be addressing it one day. We you know let don't get it twisted. Um, mm -hmm. And shout out to 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 my OG, the Ruben Ben Wahad, who will be eighty years old this year. I want y'all to let yeah. that set in. Yeah. I want y'all let that set yeah. in. That's so. Uh, um, yeah. There are yeah. a lot of criticisms about mm -hmm. uh, Baba Daruba. I even have a few, but can't take nothing from him. This brother put in nineteen years of imprisonment. We're not talking about the work before he went in. 19 years of wrongful imprisonment and he made it to, he, he has made it to the age of 80 and that's something to be celebrated that ain't nothing to sneeze at so again shout out to baba deruba but uh this yeah. was back in 2017 i just mm -hmm. got so tired and i said let me call up baba deruba i said baba what did y'all mean when you said pork chop nationalists and according to baba deruba pork chop nationalists were those who elevated African culture above revolutionary black nationalism. Pork chop nationalism had no revolutionary analysis of capitalism or the limitations between class and race. It primarily viewed white supremacy as the only enemy and black workers in the same context as white workers. And that inevitably black wealth was seen as a legitimate and reasonable answer to poverty if we would only buy black and black culture as a bulwark against Eurocentric values. Of course, this led to internal differences exploited by COINTELPRO. On the East Coast, and this is what was key for me, on the East Coast, there was a radical tradition of Pan-African politics and black Pan-African culture, morality, and values not so on the West Coast. This would ultimately split cadres, influence, influence politics, and weaken the party. So, you know, a lot of folks, like I said, some of whom, not only they, but they mamas and they daddies wasn't even a gleam in somebody's mm -hmm. eye back in the day. They running around here talking about, oh, that's a pork chop nationalist. You a pork chop nationalist. Why? Because they got an African name? Why? Because they were in a booba or a dashiki, but at the same time, they're talking about the need for revolution, but you stuck on the name or the hairstyle or the clothing. Are you going to call Daruba Ben Wahad a pork chop nationalist? M. Tayari Shabaka Sundiata, Safia Bukhari, Kuwasi Balagun, Asata Shakur, Afeni Shakur, Mutulu Shakur, Seku Odinga, Sundiata Okoli, you going to call them? Really? Really? They, they, they ain't gonna call Tanda Seasway the pork chop nationalist and get away with it. Well, you know what I'm no, saying? they ain't gonna get away with it. But <laughs> I don't have the history that these people have who are on the scene, contemporaries, comrades of Huey Newton when he made this statement. How are you gonna talk? Are, are, are you talking about these individuals when you say a pork chop? Because you you couldn't possibly be talking about them. Therefore, right. what are you talking about? But Spin you know. Out. But you know, Tandy, that that that's you know that that's one of the things, and I'm, I'm gonna keep it funky because you know that's how we do around these parts. Shout out, shout out to Say Cool and the folks who sent me this lovely hoodie right here, down in Texas and whatnot. We're gonna see if we can get it on. You know, our our, our OG who's now an ancestor right now, right? Yes, yes. Um, you know, the thing is, the problem is, 
unfortunately, the one, one of the things I'm grateful for, Tandy, is we had the opportunity to sit at the feet of elders. So a lot of these folks that people talk about now, you know, they talk about the Dr. Benz, the Dr. Clarks and all of those type folks. But then they talk about, you know, the, the MTIRES, of course, which most people don't talk about because they don't know. You know what I'm saying? But they talk about the Sekus and, you know, and, and the Darubas and so on and so forth. But they don't know them. They might have saw a video or something mm-hmm. of that nature. And they come to these conclusions that don't conclude, as Chairman Fred would say, right? Mm-hmm. But one of the things that, that I hate about the Internet, I say it's the gift and it's the curse. Gift and the mm-hmm. curse because of the fact that you can get valuable information, but then you get a smorgasbord of bullshit as well mixed in. So you can't tell what's real shit and what's bullshit. Exactly. You understand what I'm saying? So yeah. that's one of the things that, you know, and everybody has an opinion. And that's why I usually I used to turn the chat off, but there's some great people in the chat right now. But back in the day, I would turn it off because sometimes it's just like, yo, shut up and listen. Learn. Shut up. And shut that, up. That'll do it. That'll do it. You know, yeah. because none of us know any, none of us know everything. Mm-hmm. But some of us think we know some shit that we don't know. What you read is different from what we walked. Mm-hmm. But anyway, let's talk about, you know, because you you hit some uh, some serious points right there. And that's one of the things I always try to stref- stress with the platform itself. I am unequivocally an African. I don't get caught up in no, you know, I'm of this, I'm of that. Whatever theories and theologies and all that shit that you roll with, that's all the way great. I'm an African mm-hmm. first. So I, I want, you know, for you, give us a breakdown of, when we talk about cultural nationalism versus revolutionary nationalism, what does that title mean? Because you definitely touched on the pork chop nationalist. And, um, you know, I think it's necessary to, to get a clearer understanding. So when Baba Daruba says that African culture above revolutionary black nationalism, I believe what he's saying and what I see is people say, if we just get back to what we had before white folks came, and that's a noble effort. I mean, you know, I believe some of that still to this day. I definitely believed it wholeheartedly back in the day. But first of all, what were we doing before white folks came? Something had to be going on internally that allowed the catastrophe or the ma'afa or the conditions that we see now to flourish and take root. You understand what I'm saying? something happened there was a breakdown somewhere within our traditional code it wasn't just all oh we were attacked like we don't know how to fight back the greatest right. warriors of the world have always been african people Tell what me. were some of the limitations that we had was it because of a stratified society was it because of class was it because of the germs of disrespect of women uh, what, what what were the what were the morality and ethics that we had? Did we begin to go astray? Was it was it because of exposure to white folks and the um, casting out of some black folks who no longer, as opposed to embracing them and attempting to to heal them, they decided to go the other way. I, I don't know what it was, but I know something happened. I know that there cannot be a blanket return to what we had before. So to state that just African culture by itself is revolutionary, I do believe that the majority of African culture is diametrically opposed to European culture. But the key question is, is it opposed to oppression? Right. Is it opposed to domination? Is it opposed to exploitation? And if, you know, it's interesting that this would, I never thought I'd say this, it's easy to beat up on white folk. They make it too easy for you. Yeah, yeah. You ain't going to never have a shortage of material to, to blame white folks for. But is that all? So, yeah, African culture is opposed to European culture. Are we opposed to exploitation? Are we opposed to domination? Those yeah. are the kinds of questions that we have to begin to ask. So when Baba Daruba says that we had no revolutionary analysis of this economic political system known as capitalism talking about the the, the, the uh, talking about uh, trains of thought strands of thought uh that emerged in the movement what is he saying 
that all we have to do is buy black. You know, W.B. Dubois, who ended up leaving the United States and was a socialist at the end of his life, at a certain point in time, he's like, you know what? We we gonna need to cut ourselves off from black from white people just to survive. So he mm-hmm. was very instrumental in supporting the cooperative movement. But is cooperatives the, is it going to is it going to free us? I believe that it will definitely help us. Is it going to eventually free us? Not while capitalism is on the scene. If we're not going to oppose capitalism and imperialism, we just setting ourselves up for failure. We're simply yeah. setting ourselves up for failure. And unfortunately, again, see the West Coast is different from the East Coast. Baba Daruba broke it down. You know, folks out here will see an African name or they will see a dashiki and they'll look upon it with scorn. But at the same time, simply wearing a dashiki is not going to free you. Now, how it is that some people think that the totality of cultural nationalism is, let's just wear our own clothing, let's just wear our hair natural, let's change our names and we'll be free. No, there's some behavioral things that need to take place, not only within you, but in the society at large. See, this is one of the issues that I have with Moors, and I know that's a whole nother. <laughs> you, 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 just, you, just, you just going up there jumping in right now. Andy. Hold with, on with, now. With both crippled feet. Look, you know, <laughs> when I hear the Moors, they keep talking about the fact that black is not a nationality. What is your nationality? You know, as a revolutionary, uh, as a new African revolutionary nationalist, I understand nationality. But see, here's the thing for me. Just because you declare you have a nationality, don't mean white folks are going to respect it. You got to fight these people. Where is the organized confrontation against imperialism, capitalism, against this hegemonic society? If you ain't talking about that, hush your mouth. You just bumping your gums, as we say. And I want to I want to, you know, because I know that you're not making a blanket statement because I do know some revolutionary moors, you know, right. um, There's always shot, some shot. revolutionaries. Yeah, yes. Yeah. In all of these movements, organizations, etc. Without a doubt. So shout out to our brother Akhenaten um and Lakeem over this way and so many others. But Large I want to point out you know it. That's that that that's that's our brother. Tell that you know brother what I said what's up. I, I definitely will. He matter of fact, he plays the shows all the time. So this might get some play on WRFG. So definitely <laughs> shout out to <laughs> especially okay. if you know you shouted him out. Anyway, uh that's my man. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I want to say, man, you know, because what you're saying is, is 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 spot on. And that's the thing. It's like when you talk about sovereignty, sovereignty is not just, you know, um, space. You know, it's not just a word. It's not just, you know, you have this card and that's it. No, it is a mindset that you have to defend. It is physical, mental and spiritual, you know. And the thing is, a lot of these folks don't understand revolution. Right. Mm-hmm. They talk that revolutionary talk because like when I'm listening to you saying that a lot of folks on the West Coast shun the whole African name, so on and so forth. And, and culture, a lot of folks here pretty much all over the place because of the fact that they are, you know, it, it it's easier to look European, act European and look through um, uh your African mind with European lenses, right? So it's, it's, it's a lot easier to do that than to say, okay, boom, I am an African. You will notice it's a lot of people, you know what I'm saying? And I'm not talking about folks that don't call themselves African or whatever, but there are a lot of people that want to be everything but what they are. You understand what I'm saying? So I think that part of that culture is not, when it comes to revolution, culture is a, is a necessity. You understand what I'm saying? You have to be clear. It's just like your politics, political education. You have to be clear. But your culture, uh, uh, an African without culture is, is confused. You understand what I'm saying? So if we don't bring this platform right here, if we don't bring culture to this platform, then we stand a chance of becoming, for all practical purposes, a, a left breakfast club. Hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Because we'll be so confused and we'll start tearing down more than we building. You understand well, you what I'm know, saying? One of the issues that I have with folks is we think that culture is hairstyle. 
Culture right. is African dance. Culture is dashikis or bubas. Culture is your adaptation to your divine environment. Culture is how you live your life. What we're doing right now is culture. What's the word I'm looking for? It, it always, um, indaba, mm -hmm. a South African word. Indaba, meaning uh, indaba from South Africa or joko from New York, a word meaning sit down. Big yes. meeting where we all come together and hash stuff out. That's your culture. That's your culture. Yes. Us trying to figure out what the hell is going on with each other, with white folks, with imperialism, with sexism, with uh, sexuality. Us trying to figure out and dialogue and coming up, that is culture. It's like Cabral sure. said, you know, you can, the, the, the degree to which your culture is different from your oppressor. And I'm, I'm getting his, uh, his, his actual quote, I'm mixing it up, mixing it up, but he talks about, I believe, national liberation and culture. The seeds of your resistance are already in your culture. Without a doubt. They're already That's in, in your, your DNA. Right. How, how is it looking at how it's different from the, the oppressor, from the enemy, from the imperialist, from the colonialist, from the slave master? All of this is contained within your culture. So it's not just something that you put on. It's why you put it on in the first place. That's right. So so this, so this, in other words, which is what, and I'm not the first to say this, our elders talked about this too. It's like a manufactured um, argument, revolutionary nationalism versus cultural nationalism. It all needs to be taken into consideration. It all sure. needs to be utilized to fight who we got to fight. Right, right. No, and that, that's that's what you're saying is, again, it, it's, it's spot on because the one thing that I've learned about, about our, our people's liberation movement is that it's always an imbalance. Not always, but for the most part, as a whole, there's an imbalance. You got some folks who have brute force. You have some folks who are just so mental. They know every goddamn thing. You can't tell. They ain't never wrong. You know what I'm saying? And all they want to do is be right. You understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So if you ain't never wrong and you always right, then you starting off wrong. You understand what I'm saying? That's the first thing. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? And then, then it has to be the, the spiritual component. To me, spirituality and culture are hand in hand. They're conjoined twins. They're part of the same DNA. Absolutely. And folks don't understand that. So when I hear people say that, you know, they have no no spiritual uh, position. It's not about religion. You understand what I'm saying? You know, like you said, your culture, the African is a spiritual being by nature. This is by design. It's not how I want you to feel. This ain't mm -hmm. something to make me look good. It ain't mm -hmm. something to make me feel good. If you don't feel uh, the spirit within you, then no wonder you're not out here fighting. Mm. I'm going to get cocky and say that. <laughs> you know, one of the things that uh, Mama Fannie Lou Hamer said, said everything is political. The air we breathe is political. It's politically polluted air, right? So we, we let's talk about African traditional religion and spirituality, for example. You have people in the United States who are no longer Christian who have embraced the traditions of our ancestors, the Akan tradition, uh, the Yoruba, the Ifa tradition, uh, by way of either by way of Africa or by way of Cuba, Santeria, by way of Brazil, Candomblé. Because African people are criminalized in this country, by extension, everything we do is criminalized, which is why not only is our hair criminalized, like the young brother in Dallas, Texas, who can't go to school because his hair has been criminalized and the superintendent of the school took out a, pay, a full page ad, like Donald Trump, condemning, or should I say, supporting his decision to keep this brother out of school. Mm -hmm. We were not allowed to have our worship services, right? We were not allowed to do the things we need to do in our traditions, like sacrificing animals. And when I say sacrificing animals, really all I'm talking about is eating. Right. Y'all have oxtails and goat all the time, but how else do you going to get to go to if you don't kill the goat? You kill the goat, you feed the deities, then you cut up the meat, you put some curry and some whatever, and then you serve it to the people. 
We could not do that in religious ceremonies until one of the uh, African traditional communities in Florida, I believe it was, uh, I can't remember the name of the temple, but in Hialeah, Florida, they uh, filed a lawsuit because the police was breaking down people's doors trying to arrest us because we got chickens and goats in our backyard trying to do what we need to do to reconnect, not only to reconnect to our ancestors, but to just live our lives. So but you know why that is, though. Has been so our entire existence, i.e., our culture, us, our lives, our very beings, and our culture has been criminalized. So yeah, if you if you don't understand the need that you're gonna have to fight back, right. I don't know what to tell you. Criminalization, criminalized and bastardized. And you know, I, I see someone in the in the comments saying if everything's political, then it's also my political choice to not have a spiritual practice. We're not talking about a spiritual practice, spirituality is different. You don't don't confuse religion. In spirituality, that's what? not what we're talking about. I don't even know what's the point of that comment. I don't know. Don't Maybe, you have a spiritual practice? Anybody said you had to have one? Yeah, we there, there's no force here. This isn't you know, we, we're 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 going through <laughs> we 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 kicking it right now. We talking about what moves us and what moves a lot of the quote unquote because you know funny thing is a lot of folks have problems with religion and spirituality, but then they big up. And 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 idolize those fighters who actually come from spiritual or religious systems. You understand what I'm saying? I had to tell a cat the other day. Remind yeah, me I, I had to tell a cat the other day because he was like banging on Christianity, but he had a Garvey shirt on. I'm like, you do know Garvey was a Christian, right? So if we're gonna talk about respecting our ancestors, now we don't have to respect everything they did. We don't have to. We don't have to choose to do what they've done. But there are ways in which. We should be able to uh, protect our our position, to protect our peace, to protect our livelihood, to strengthen ourselves, you know. But if not, we'll be confused into arguing about what came first, the African or the egg. The reality is, at the end of the day, whatever works, if you not having a religion or spirituality works for you, then that's great. Break your leg, good luck. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 if, and if this one does or don't. All I want to know is what it do. What's the results? Mm. Are you fighting or you not fighting? You trying to get free or you not trying to get free? I'm not here to argue and debate debate about, you know, what I do or what I practice. Whatever you do and whatever you practice is good. Mm. The folks I run with, it works for us. You know what I mean? So that's pretty much how we get down around these parts. But anyway, I want to. I want we we started out well. It says culturalism, cultural nationalism versus revolutionary nationalism. And I want to talk about Deborah's book. Yes. And and yeah, but I got to tell I knew this was going to come up because how could it not in this subject? I want to tell you a story real quick. You know, I used to live in Atlanta, right? Mm -hmm. You know Baba uh, Askia Ture? Of course. From Ram. From right. Boston. From Ram, from Ram Boston. Um, part of back in the day, he was part of the uh, the Atlanta project, which is the SNCC chapter that got kicked out or the parts of the Atlanta chapter of SNCC that got kicked out because they was too black. And he's so a great I, poet. Great poet, right. Yes. Baba, when I lived in Atlanta, Baba Eskia and I, and y'all just hold on, let me tell the story. I'm going to tie it in uh, at some point. Baba Eskia and I went to lunch one day at uh, Chantrell's in the West End. Hmm. And I don't remember how, you know, we were just talking, just kicking it. <sighs> wide range of different stuff and i don't remember exactly how this point came up but baba askia dropped this gem in the conversation this was over 25 years ago and it has stuck in my craw it has remained with me all of this time i don't remember what we was talking about i don't i like to try and give background and context i can't remember but you know how Baba Eskia talks, yeah, and the but the but the but and the but the but. So he was talking, and he said, yeah, and you know half the BLA was Muslim Mayoraba, and but the but the but. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> he didn't say but the but the but, did he? He didn't say but the but the but. But you know, I can't remember what they. All I remember was now, that. Now I can't go back to Boston because of you. But go ahead. <laughs> he said, wait a minute, half the BLA was Muslim Mayoraba. Right. And periodic, and at some point, I was like, "Wait a minute!" This was years later. Like, wait a minute, what did he say? 
And so I'm like, okay, Kuasi Bala Goon, Rima Olubala, Changa Olubala, Kimu Olubala, Sada Olubala Shakur, Bashir Hamid, Abdul Majid, Seku Odinga. Lil Munta King, the Ruba Ben Wahad, Balao Sunni Ali. Wait a minute. If we go on and on. All these Muslims and Yarbas in the BLA throwing down. What was that about? And the BGF as well. Man, so that's something I've been trying to research on my own. I've been hitting some bricks. Hint, hint, anybody out there that can help us this out. But uh, yeah, so again, going back to what Baba Deruba said, this tradition of radical Pan-African, African politics, ethics, morality, worldview swept up and down the East Coast. And unfortunately, I believe, unfortunately, its expression out here on the West Coast was, all right, let me not say, well, yeah, it, it, it found its expression in Karinga and his work, but also to be semi-fair, the disdain, the flip side of that was the disdain that Northern California Oakland Panthers had. Huey Newton and uh, what's the dude's name? David um, Hilliard. David Hilliard. Yeah, I know uh, Baba Daruba got a mouth, mouthful to say about David Hilliard. <laughs> yes, gonna say that. When, he, when he went to the East Coast and saw Zaid uh, Shakur and Lamuma Shakur, he was like, oh, he was aghast. So, right. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's, I think that's so unfortunate because right. there's really no reason why. Well, first of all, I, I can't even say there's no reason why it could not have been merged. It was merged on the East Coast. Right. But out here, this way, it's a cultural desert, you know. Hmm. Well, we, we got, and, I, and shout out to, you know, to, to our OG and uncle, uh, who we just, um, I just played one of his, an older show of him the other day, Kamasi, and I'll be having him on the show again soon. Um, because there are folks... Uh, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I was going to say that folks like him who are archivists and uh, historians when it comes to not only our movement, but just, uh, quote unquote, the street organizers, the gang culture, whatever, as they would say. And, um, you know, one of the brothers that, that I respect highly, uh, my birthday twin, matter of fact. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful day that day. But anyway, you you, you were saying something. <laughs> Oh, you kill me, brother. But I was going to say, uh, <laughs> Baba Kumasi, who is, his credentials, his work are impeccable. Right. It was Baba Kumasi who brought Deborah's existence to the attention of the Tom and Ethel Bradley Center at Cal State Northridge. They mm. are the ones who have been conducting oral histories to make sure that Black Los Angeles is documented and they made a particular effort to get civil rights activists and black power activists and when they brought in kumasi after his many hours of interviews he said you know you know who y'all need to interview y'all need to interview deborah jones and people was like who's deborah jones well, deborah jones that's the sister that testified against karinga people was like you know deborah jones kumasi like yeah she be at the slawson reunion picnic over at side park <laughs> Can who Kumasi don't know on the West Coast? <laughs> they was like, can you please bring her in? Kumasi brought Deborah Jones in and she sat for an oral history project. And yeah. I was made aware of it uh, maybe a year or two years later. They said, this needs to be a book. You two need to meet and talk about how you can turn this into a book. And that's what we did. So forever and a day, shout out to Baba Kumasi. Forever and a day. Okay. Well, let's get let's get into that. We should have I should have brought him on there about that. I'm gonna talk to him. And be like, yeah, Tandy said said uh, it, it, it's your fault the book came out. I didn't tell that mother. No. See, yeah, that's how lies get started, brother. No, my my headphones. I didn't hear you well. But anyway, no doubt. Shout out, shout out well, to, to good thing this is being recorded. Good thing oh, this man. is being documented because we have the correct well, record. You, you, you sound like Al Sharpton. Though a good thing is recorded. But anyway, but <laughs> let's let, let, let's you get to what? it. You know what? what what's happening? Okay. All right. You yeah, know what? Daddy, you my sister. Now you got a picture of me on the camera. But I'm, anyway. I'm, leaving. I'm leaving. Keep keep on here. 
<laughs> keep on, and I'm leaving. I ain't gonna say nothing about that because I done seen some of your shows before. But anyway, <laughs> what? Ooh, I'm gonna move right, move, move, move right I'm gonna along, man. I'm gonna get Andy. you back. Just know. Listen to, to the yeah. folks in the chat. We appreciate you all for sure. Again, Tandy is a longtime comrade who who I appreciate, you know, with all seriousness because of the consistency. You understand? And it, and it, I think her and I are an example of, of long-term growth. You understand what I'm saying? Because there's times we wasn't talking, but then, you know what I'm saying? We grew to where we are and I'm grateful to call Tanya a comrade, you know, even though sometimes some of the folks on the West coast try to get to me through her and it don't usually work out because I pull them West coast cards that you was talking about and we know how we do. But anyway, <laughs> we probably wasn't talking because you were lying on me. Wow. Don't be that way, Tanya. Oh, now you now it's don't be that way. All right. Uh, that's not me. That's the other folks from BPM. But anyway, listen. Moving right along. <laughs> moving right along. Um, let's talk about this book. What is the name of it? We talk about uh, Sister Deborah, who at some point we're gonna get her on the platform. Either mm -hmm. you know you're gonna have her on your show, or you're gonna have her on my show, or we're gonna have both y'all together, one way or the other. But let's talk about that. Give us the name of the book and why folks should be checking it out. So the name of the book is What We Stood For. And that was the title we uh, that the publisher suggested and the title we eventually settled on because that's not the reason why Deborah joined the organization. She didn't join the organization to see men mistreating women. She certainly did not join the organization to be accused of trying to assassinate Poison Karinga. And she certainly did not uh, choose to be a part of the organization that would ultimately uh, torture beat and sexually assault her. That is not why she wanted to be a part of that organization. And dare I say, that is not why any of us join these organizations. And it is heartbreaking and infuriating that that is what still happens in some of these organizations. Regardless of how we feel about <coughs> Hammer <clears throat> in Atlanta, regardless of how we feel about some of these organizations that's not why people join them mm -hmm. you know we join because we see people in what we think are moving in a positive direction we hear something that resonates with us we see something that we like we want more information and we join and for a lot of folks it's a horror show you know mm -hmm. one of the things that has always well not always but has that has stuck with me and this is a shameless plug. You know, I got two other books out. Some of Us Are Brave, Volumes 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. um, Conversations with Sisters on Life, Art, and Struggle. I have a transcript of Mama Asada Shakur speaking to sisters in Cuba in the book. And one of the things she says in there, talking about her activism when she started to get involved in the 60s, and the, some of the sexism she encountered, she talks about the fact that, you know, there are still a lot of us sisters around from that time. And if we get to telling our stories, it will be very interesting. And she even talked about some of the things in that interview and in her own uh, autobiography about what she saw, you know, women having to walk behind men or bringing a bowl so a man can wash his hands and, and eat first and all this other madness. It's like, are we, I'm sorry, why are we here? Are we here to get free? Are we here to stroke somebody's ego and other body parts? What, 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 what are we doing here? What are we right, doing? Right. So yeah, Deborah joins us in late, in, in, in 1968, during a time of heightened activity not only nationally, but in Los Angeles. You know, of course, we got Bunchy and John on the scene. Eldridge had been in L.A. Eldridge and Bunchy uh, re-met or met and re-met in uh, prison. Uh, I think Bunchy was, Bunchy and his brother Arthur were like the best men's at the wedding of mm -hmm. Kathleen and Eldridge in Los Angeles. So there's there's been that had been that long relationship, you know, Geronimo Jijaga, all of the different things that had been going on. And in, in my research, even though this is Deborah's story in my research so to make sure that I was comfortable with what was going on, 
you know, I'm finding out that us and the Panthers had a friendly relationship in the beginning. And that's not the story that I have heard that most people have heard. It's like oil and water. You couldn't get them in the same room together. And that's not how it was in the beginning. Us was started in 1965, a few weeks after the Watts Rebellion. And the Panthers came on the scene in 66. By 67, October of 67, Huey is shot and in, imprisoned for the death of this cop. And the organization experiences phenomenal growth while he's imprisoned, um, fighting for his life because he could have faced the death penalty. So at the same time, you've got us on the scene attempting to recruit throughout Los Angeles. And so many people I've talked to talked about the fact that everybody knew everybody in Los Angeles. It's the same thing in Atlanta. It's the same thing in New York. But I'm not in Atlanta or New York. I'm talking about LA. Y'all went to high school together. You went to dances together. You went roller skating together. You went to the beach. You went to the park. You was dating this sister who was who was the brother of, of this dude who was, you had a gang fight with this brother. It was just everybody knew everybody. And people gravitated toward particular lines. The more political confrontational line of the Panthers or the more can't stand white folks. Ooh, they look different. <laughs> These us people, they looking and sounding different. You know, what's going on here? And that's a that's a oversimplification of the differences. But uh, yeah, it's a, it was it's a very interesting, very interesting you know, time period. You know, and, and to your point about everybody knowing everybody, you know, um, that's one of the things Kamasi talked about coming from Bunchy's neighborhood. Mm. Because he talked about how Bunchy Carter was, I guess, a few years older than him. And he was coming up, you know, as a, uh, you know, up under that particular um, lane. Mm. And, you know, it, it's wild because when we look at these different freedom fighters, for one thing, <clears throat> those of us who weren't there, you know, who came on the scene later, I came in 1970, you know what I'm saying? But those of us who weren't there, you know, we get this romantic or romanticized version of the party, of us, so on and so forth. And I think it's necessary that we're clear that, you know, it's not like all the Panthers knew each other. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? It's like, you know, even the quote unquote popular ones, it's just that in their particular areas, they were familiar with who, who they were familiar with. And it was different politics going on in different areas. You know, everything wasn't the same. I mm -hmm. want to point out real quick for folks who are checking it out, um, our brother on the platform, Dr. Uh, Sundiata Chajwa, uh, who has the show Real Talk, he actually did an interview with Marlana Karanga um, that you could pull up on the platform. And he actually posed a couple questions that, you know, the, the question about uh, uh, Bunchy and uh, John Huggins being uh, assassinated at UCLA, and also the question around the sisters that you're talking about now. Um, I want to ask you, like, what were some of the things you learned from the book and that you can share before folks get their own copy? Like, what are some things that some key points that stood out for you that, that made you know that, okay, this is something that, that, that definitely has to come out. What, what was some of the points that stuck out? Well, let me say real quick though, before I get into that, on that particular show of real talk with Dr. Sundi Adacharjo and Maulana Karinga, Karinga states that there was no victim. That's right. That it did not happen. Now he has always maintained his innocence, his innocence. He was always said it was trumped up charges. That was the first time I ever heard him say there was no victim. It did not happen. Hmm. And, you know, black people are so forgiving. You know, we say, well, he did his time and, you know, we should just move on. Yeah, he may have done some time. And it's one thing to say that it was a trumped up charge. It's another thing to say that this did not happen. Geronimo Jijaga was falsely accused and wrongfully imprisoned, but a white woman was killed in Santa Monica. That's right. Okay. Let's be clear yeah. on that. Someone did die. And he was he, hundreds of miles away. He, Let's just get that he, he, right. he was, he was, and the FBI 
because they wiretapped the phone. They have a record, a log of him picking up the phone and saying hello because a call came through at the meeting that he was at for him. So it's one thing to say, I was wrongfully accused. I was wrongfully convicted. And it's another thing to say, this did not happen. Ain't nobody ever said that white woman in Santa Monica was not killed. We said Geronimo, not only did Geronimo not do it, it was pinned on him. So there's a difference between I didn't do this or this did not happen. And so to forgive someone who does not even admit that something happened or maybe somebody got carried away or maybe I don't really remember. But instead of saying I don't remember, saying it did not happen. That's 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 hard. That's a hard pill to swallow right there. Right. Right. No, that's that, hard that's, pill to swallow. Right. And he said it. He said, you know, and, and I, you know, it's, it's wild because, see, I go back just real quick to being around when Dr. Clark denounced him in his face in New York. You mm -hmm. know, so I've always had my I, I'm not going to front. I had my biases when it came to um, to him because, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's how I felt. And it's only based off of what I have studied, read people I talked to, so on and so forth. So I'm excited about this book because I know that you have unearthed some things that 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 haven't been said publicly. And this is from one woman's perspective. This is Deborah's memoir. And let me give a shout out real quick to Dr. Scott Brown, because he has done, to my knowledge, the only book that has looked at the US organization, not from the standpoint of its leader or icon, Karinga, but from the rank and file, the members, the people who chose to be a part of this organization and believe in its principles and who were hurt who were crushed when John and Bunchy were killed, who were hurt and crushed when Deborah and Gail were tortured, and who believed these women from the beginning. I called one brother, his name is Ngoma Ali, member of the US organization. Now, as a journalist, journalism is, there's a quote that journalism is a discipline of verification. This was not, quote unquote, a history book. This is Deborah's memoir. This is what she says happened. You know, this is not me as a historian writing a book about something that happened. This is what I told a person the other day, the bones and the meat and the skeleton, the skeleton in the meat is Deborah. I'll just put the cocoa butter on it. That's all I did was put some cocoa butter on it, right? This is her story. But the journalist in me, I had to fight the need to verify every single thing she said. I had to fight the need to defend her. This is like I tell people all the time, this Nene Leakes, she said what she said. This is what she said happened. End of discussion. But they are still, okay, I got it. Let me ask such and such. So in Goma Ali, I was told that was one of the people who attended the trial of Karinga for Deborah's uh, torture on an almost daily basis. It's been 50 years. These people are all in their 70s and up. But I called him up on the hopes that he could remember something and tell me about the trial. So I call him up and I identify myself. Hi, my name is Tanda Seasway Shimaringa. I'm a writer here in Los Angeles, and I am assisting Deborah Jones with her memoir. Deborah is the woman who testified against Karinga in 1970. That's the first thing I said to him when he picked up the phone. And when I said at, at 1970 period, the first words out of his mouth, oh, yeah, we all knew he did that. Damn. I said, sir, I'm calling you because I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about what you might remember from the trial. Do you mind if I record you? No, go ahead. Click. Could you repeat what you just said to me when I called you and you picked up the phone? When I told you that Deborah was the woman? He said, oh, yeah, we all knew he did that. I said, OK, well, now I'm confused because 
I thought everybody was saying, you know, like Holly C. Clyde, Holly C., the vice chair of us at the time. I thought everybody was saying Karinga didn't do that. He said, well, the rank and file knew he did that. Mm. It was the other people in, in, in his inner circle who didn't believe it and promoted that she was lying. I was like, wow. For this man to say that when I first he first picked up the phone, I was like, oh, my God. So that was one of the things, one of the quote unquote verifications that comes to me without me even trying to verify it. I just wanted to know what he remembered about the trial. Now, now listen, I, Tony. He did it. Yeah, yeah. So th this is what I want to do, right? Because I think that, again, um, one of the things that you, myself, and many comrades are guilty of, we talk about things as if folks already know the story, right? Right. So mm -hmm. we, we like even when we talk about terms, we throw terms around counterinsurgency, COINTELPRO, so mm -hmm. on and so forth. Like, like everybody already knows what it is. Mm -hmm. There are about 190 something people watching us right now live. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm willing to bet that a large percentage of them don't know this story. Mm -hmm. They may have heard the Bunchy John situation, that story. But for what you're talking about right now, can you give us a brief recap? on what it is you're saying because some folks confused they like man i just celebrated kwanzaa i just got me a new canara and all this other stuff and they let me speak you know talk about it the us organization has some of the baddest canaras i've ever seen i'm mad i'm still mad <laughs> i never got one from them but at any rate i'm talking about this new book just dropped in the end of february that i had the opportunity to co-author it's called what we stood for the story of a revolutionary black woman by deborah jones it is her memoir. Deborah Jones, along with Gail Davis, are the two women who were tortured, assaulted over Mother's Day weekend in 1970 on the orders of Maulana Karinga, co-founder of the US organization, widely known as the creator of Kwanzaa, which is another story for uh, another show for another day. He has always maintained that he it was a trumped up uh, charge and that he uh, is innocent, and Deborah Jones and Gail Davis say differently. They, they, to my knowledge, Gail spoke with Scott Brown, and it's re somewhat recounted in his book "Fighting for Us," but has not given any other interviews uh, ever, to my knowledge. Hmm. Deborah did a an oral history interview for the Black Power Archives, part of the Tom and Ethel Bradley. Uh, oral history project at California State University Northridge. That's how I was put in contact with her. And this is a result of that initial oral history interview. This book is her memoir talking about her life growing up in Los Angeles as a black girl, her entry uh, being around her the, in, in, in the development of black power in the beginning, joining the US organization, suffering that horrendous assault, her descent, uh, and the trauma that not only uh, she endured, but afterwards and her climb back. That word resilience gets thrown around a lot, but this is part of her story. When you when you talk about torture, because I don't think that again, and I don't know if you want to get into it, but you know, hung up by their by their hands in a garage, hung up uh, in the ceiling by their hands, whipped. Uh, beaten, um, a hot soldering iron was applied to the face and mouth of Gail Davis. Gail Davis, you know, the organization was polygamous. So Gail was said to be one of Karinga's wives. So she was not sexually assaulted. Deborah says that she was sexually assaulted. At the time, however, this is 1970, uh, there was a sense of shame, embarrassment around being raped. She never told the police that she was raped, neither Karinga or any of the other two men who were convicted along with Karinga, along with Karinga's wife, were charged with rape. Uh, but she talks about it in this book for the first time. And the um, reasoning behind this, this torture, because I, I mean, I, I'm, and again, I'm not. Is because Maulana Karinga thought that these two women 
were out to kill him. They were trying to poison him. And the torture was to extract information from them on the existence of the poison. Where is the poison? Where are the poison crystals? Where You're sticking, you're using hypodermic needles to inject poison into soda cans. You've put, you've smeared some type of substance on the wall. So if I touch it, I will be poisoned. Where is, who put, set you up? Who set you up with this? Who sent you? Where's the existence of the poison? And they're telling him, we do not know what you're talking about. We don't know what you're talking about. And part of the part of the reason this has happened is because Karinga is now paranoid that people are out to kill him. You talked earlier about us not being on the scene while these folks are walking around, uh, Panthers, us, etc. Some of us not even part of the, um, you know, the Panther schools or et cetera. How do we learn about this time period if we were not there? We talk to the people who were there. We read the books that have been written by others and by the people who were actually there. But we see the videos. We see the newscasts. We see the movies. And when it comes to us and the Panthers, I can name all kinds of Panthers, even though I wasn't there. I can name Elaine Brown, Ray Masai Hewitt, uh, Fred Hampton, Zaid Shakur, Afeni Shakur, Safiya Bukhari. I can name all these people because I see them. Uh, Jake Satchel, uh, all uh, Jake Spurgeon, Jake Winters, excuse me. I can name all these people because I see them in all of these uh, different areas. How many people can you name from the US organization? One person, Maulana Karinga. Right. So when people say That's they out to get us, the belief is, oh, they out to get Karinga. So everywhere he turns, he's like, okay, people are trying to kill me. And he's on drugs. I had been hesitant to say that, but everybody else has says it. Right. Uh, what's my brother's name? Uh, our elder, um, Amiri Baraka says it in his book. He's on drugs, prescription, and probably illicit drugs. And he's paranoid. People are out to kill me. And you two people who are closest to me are out to kill me. Now, he was convicted along with his wife, who he's still married to, Tiamoyo Karinga. I don't know what issue he had with Gail, but um, Deborah talks about the fact that she has always been the kind of person who's like, no, that doesn't sound right. She don't go for the okie doke. She's not a cult member. She's not just a follower, even though, you know, you're in an organization, but you're not a follower. No, that don't sound right to me. When 800 other people are saying, yeah, yeah. She's like, no, that don't sound right. So she's been on his radar anyway. Now, his issue he had with Gail, I don't know. But these two women were taken into his garage over here in Inglewood, California. And for L.A. folks, off of Crenshaw and Imperial and tortured for three days, Mother's Day weekend. It's insane, man. I mean, it's like, you know, just being around and, and seeing, you know, Dr. Clark's reaction back in the early 90s and whatnot. <clears throat> and just reading and talking to so many different OGs. You know, there, there's always been, you know, of course, every now and then you run into to different people with different perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And and we respect that, but I try to weigh weigh it on on what it is that what what are the facts? You understand what I'm saying? And I think that what happens is, unfortunately, in our community. And when I say our community, of course, that's a vast word, but let's just say the movement community or the organizing community. One of the things I notice is it's all about personality. You understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? How uh, magnetic is an individual, you know what I'm saying? How, who likes them, who don't like them? Mm -hmm. And it becomes a popularity thing. Well, I don't like what he said about such and such. Well, I don't like what she said about blah, blah, blah. So you automatically, the deck is stacked. And that's what happened with these sisters right here. They weren't popular. They weren't, um, you know, folks thing, you know, they, they weren't the uh, Supreme potentate, you know what I'm saying? They weren't the, uh, uh, 
the messianic uh, leadership. So unfortunately, they was looked down upon and they were tortured. And, and you know, like so many cases, not just with that, with a number of different parties and whatnot. You talk about folks being delusional, folks like Yui. You know what I'm saying? Of course, that's a, a, a story for another day. But, you know, the, the paranoia and everything, you know, literally, you know, putting putting hits out on folks like, OK, boom, th these people are enemies of the state. The mm -hmm. was one of those people wanted to cover the newspaper, the panther mm -hmm. paper. So the thing is, we don't get caught up in, in cult of personality. We don't get caught up in, in, you know, hearsay, rumors. You know, wh wh where's in Islam? We say, where's the Dalil? Where's the proof? You know mm. what I'm saying? Where's the evidence? You know mm. what I'm saying? And and you know, man, it, it's it's a you know, and, and See, then you get, goes, go ahead, go that ahead. Goes, that goes back to you know, were you convicted on a trumped up charge or did it happen? And right. again, you know, the whole thing of verification and you know, verifying and documenting Scott Brown worked on this book as part of his uh, his book, uh, Fighting for Us, which I encourage people to read as part of his doctoral dissertation. He was living on the East Coast. He went to Cornell under Dr. James Turner. And one of the people he talked to who was a former Us member, I don't know how many people know this, James M. Tume. And we always say, M. Tume, Juicy Fruit? Yes, that M. Tume. That M. Tume, Tume yes. Juicy Fruit was a member of the Us organization at one time. He ends up leaving because he was out here in Los Angeles. He goes back east, leaves the organization, goes back east. I don't know the reasons why he left. But after the torture, he and his wife provide harbor for Gail Davis. And mm -hmm. it is he who puts Gail in touch with Scott Brown. I have not talked to Gail. So this is, I don't want to call this hearsay. This is secondhand information. Right. You know. Not only are your sources important, do you trust your source? Do you believe your support, your source? I believe Scott Brown. Scott Brown could not tell me. He could not let me see the transcript. He could not tell me what they talked about because that's a breach of confidentiality. I get it because I'm a journalist. But what he did say to me was that, and again, this is secondhand information. He says that Gail said, I can forgive Karinga for what happened. He was not himself. What I cannot forgive is him saying it did not happen. Hmm. Real shit. So, I mean, yeah, she didn't say it to me. I believe the sources are pretty much impeccable. You know, Sidebar, real quick. You mentioned M. Tume. You know, it's you got M. Tume, who was a member of us, and you had another musical great, Nile Rogers, who was a member of the Black Panther Party. So I just wanted to give you all some quick mm -hmm. little for, for, from that era. You know what I'm saying? That yeah. You know who yeah. else was a member of the Us organization that, that surprised me, and I haven't been able to interview him yet. I I told him I wanted to talk to him about it but we haven't been able to link up yet. David Johnson, Jack, hmm. oh, member wow. of the San Quentin Six. I did not know that. Yeah, so, okay. All right. So that's wow. So we would see him during Black August as well. Yeah. Uh, him, right. Before uh, he became soon, ill. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sunyata Tate, um, mm -hmm. uh, Paco, uh, pa Paco. Yeah. Paco, and yeah. Then, yeah, 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 yeah. You're bringing me flashbacks right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I didn't know he was a member of us. So that, that's very interesting. I, 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 I forget who told me that, but when I called him, he said, yeah. I was like, well, yeah. when can we talk? And got to schedule that's, the talk. It's very interesting. For folks who are, don't know about who David Johnson is, we're talking about um, one of the folks from, when you talk about Black August, the San Quentin Six. You know what I'm saying? He's one of the the members of the San Quentin Six and one of the folks who was convicted convicted after the um, assassination of George Field Marshal George Jackson. You know what I mean? So um, again, another another tidbit because we know that 
you know, folks who bastardize or attempting to bastardize Black August and making it into all kinds of shit. Black August car wash, Black August this, Black August Communist Manifesto. None of that shit is what it is. You know what I'm saying? We gotta we gotta deal with what it is. It ain't personal. What 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 they tell us, Tanda, you 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 know what I'm saying? What did we learn? They told us that it was about political prisoners, certain political prisoners. We they told us about the 33 camps inside the 13 camps inside of or the 33 inside of uh, the state of California. That's mm-hmm. what Black August is about. It's not about what you feel it is, what you think it is. And I talked to somebody that wasn't involved in it and they think it is. Just like Tandy said a few minutes ago, man, it ain't. If you wasn't there, you at least learn from those who were there and who created the situation. But anyway. Sounds simple to me. I mean, you know, that's <laughs> like, like my father used to say, that's too much like right. But anyway. Um, <laughs> now, I saw, uh, I saw a comment in the chat and I'm not attacking this person, but I do want to make this, I do want to state this. Um, I'm born and raised in Los Angeles. I was told about the US organization and their center by an African-American studies professor at my junior college. I leave junior college. I go to Washington, D.C., a student at Howard University. I'm a refugee from Howard, but I loved being immersed in the cultural community of Washington, D.C., it is, it, it is nothing but fond memories for me. And it was well over 30 years ago. I wish I could recreate it. Wish I could have brought it back to LA with me. But uh, at any rate, that was where I first learned about Kwanzaa. I enjoyed going to Kwanzaa. And then again, when I moved to Atlanta, I enjoyed going to Kwanzaa. I come out here to LA, where the Kwanzaa at? And people look at me like I had a a tail growing out my butt and an eye in my forehead. I'm like, but it's also when I moved to DC that I learned through, you know, Z Magazine, uh, Covert Action Information Quarterly, South End Press, boom, Agents of Repression comes out. Boom, Cointel Pro Papers comes out. Somebody tells me about the Glass House tapes. This is where I learn about the crimes that happen due to Cointel Pro here in Los Angeles. Give give the authors of those books, please, for folks Jim who Vander don't Wall, Ward Churchill and Jim Vanderwall, Agents sure. of Repression, Cointel Pro Papers, The Glass House Tapes, which has its own interesting history, allegedly by <laughs> Lewis Tackwood. Right. These are the books that talk about um, Maulana Karinga and his unsavory activities i'll put it that way and i'm like but this is these are the these are the people down the street from me in la how come nobody in la told me about this right i'm like but the the reason i bring that up is regarding kwanzaa if i could find in los angeles a kwanzaa event equal to what i experienced in atlanta or dc i would be there in the front row it was heartbreaking to discover this information as the years have now gone on more information, you know, as time goes on, information comes out. You find out the origins of Kwanzaa. You find out who was there, how it actually started. So I'm not here to destroy Kwanzaa. I'm not here to give it a clean shine. I'm just here to document and share what I found out. I, when I lived in Atlanta, just before I left, I was doing work with the Metro Atlanta Kwanzaa Association. This is in the late 90s. And the year before they had, if you're in Atlanta, then you know about the Kwanzaa countdown. You know, Kwanzaa, December 26th to January 1st. The Kwanzaa countdown was a party on Christmas night because, you know, all of us nappy heads and heathens and pagans, etc. We ain't into Christmas. We ain't doing nothing Christmas night. We waiting we for Kwanzaa. Pagans. So, right. so. We having a party waiting for the stroke of midnight, December 26th, for Kwanzaa to come down. The first year I went, hey, it's a party. The next year was the year that the U.S. Postal Service put out the Kwanzaa stamp, recognizing Kwanzaa. It's y'all fault. So we get to the Kwanzaa countdown and everybody's looking like, because, you know, the whole thing of being recognized by the U.S. state, that's not who we were and what we were looking for. And people you know, are like, yeah, I guess we 
Better turn the music on now. Everybody was so <laughs> so dejected. It was almost at the time it was sad, but I can laugh about it now. I was like, damn. I gotta tell you that I've never celebrated Kwanzaa. I have uh, been to a couple uh, events, been asked to speak at a few out here. They have the Jama Fest as well. But since you're on the West Coast, I want to plug Mama Makeda uh, Cheatham, who is the executive director and founder of the World Beat Cultural Center. So if you're in San Diego next year, mm. yeah, 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 yeah. Her, her joint, she is definitely, um, you know, someone who keeps the culture, especially for folks who, uh, who go to San Diego at all. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. She's definitely a, a force um, who I've, I've literally just met uh, this past year. So definitely, uh, you know, for those on the West Coast. Um, I real know quick, we don't. Yeah. Real quick, let me just put it out there, though. What I was saying is that the fact that more information comes out, we know about Mama McKenna in the Bay Area who right. contributed greatly to the dissemination of Kwanzaa. We found out. Uh, one of the Black Power interviews that we have, oral interviews, a woman by the name of Kicheko Davis, who was mm -hmm. a member of the, uh, a founding member of the US organization. There in the beginning, she talks about how it was a collective effort to research all of this information, that Karinga was a part of it. He did not create it. And as a matter of fact, similar to the beginnings of hip hop, or the story we're told where it's DJ Red Alert, DJ Cool Hurt is asked to do a party by his baby sister. Cool work, yeah. There's a Christmas party, well, there's not a Christmas party, but there's a gathering at Karinga's house. Somebody brings a doll or something for one of his daughters at the time. And is like, oh no, we don't celebrate Christmas. And one of the children, a girl, a, a, a girl child said, well, what do we celebrate? Where are our holidays? And one of the adults kind of brushed it off and she's like, no. Where's our holiday? Where? And that was this impetus to get the adults in the organization to research and say, we need to do something for black people here in this country. So Kwanzaa has grown by leaps and bounds around the world. Uh, it is for the people. It is for the masses. I understand why some people who were not there when it happened don't celebrate it, won't celebrate it today. I get that. I'm just saying. I got I got to correct something because I've been <laughs> and my brother's going to laugh because I'm always forgetting certain things. But mm -hmm. my brother Balagoon reminded me that we put on a Kwanzaa event together one year. Now, he got to, he got to, he got you got, <laughs> got to always refresh me because I know we was at a few of them. So <laughs> we I'm going to get at the Balagoon. The rest of y'all <laughs> Shout, shout out to my comrade, my brother. You know what I'm saying in the chat. It, mm -hmm. I, he, he'll tell you, I, I'm mad forgetful when it comes to some things because we've done like so many different, mm -hmm. uh, as you know, programs. Yeah. Uh, okay, here we go. This is what it was. Thank you. So it was a reading for warriors. That's also the day we did the African Art of War together. Okay, all right. So that's what it was. We see Balagoon up there trying to run me under the gun. We utilized that to do <laughs> to do what we needed to do. So okay, that's that's why I wasn't all the way clear for a minute. I was about to call him like I don't remember the Canara. But anyway. Asante Sana Modupe Pupo Baba Balagoon. Okay, okay, check, okay. Yeah. Check the brother, check him, get him straight. Get him, <laughs> gather him up, Baba. Gather him up. See, see, Balagoon, they can't take us back from what we were. <laughs> see how they tried to divide and conquer? I, I don't know what it is. It's, Stay on root just, work, boy. I'm just, I'm just acknowledging the Baba. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> well, is that what you're doing? That's, He's waiting for somebody. Doing. He's waiting for somebody to help you out this thing. But that's anyway, all I'm doing. Hey, man. Now nah, that that's my that's my comrade and my brother. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I want to point out since he just uh, chimed in that uh, we are doing FTP 20 Hip Hop Martial Arts and Activism Conference together. We're working on that together. So, um, in fact, Piper, I know you're in the chat. We was talking about getting you involved, so definitely get at us. You know what I'm saying? We're putting together this conference during Black August, August 16th, 17th, and 18th. And, of course, there's all types of different Black August pieces that we will be commemorating around the country, in L.A., in the Bay, in Richmond, and so many other places and whatnot. So 
definitely shout out to all the comrades out that's putting in work. Listen, I'm sure we got a few minutes. I know that our good sister Jackie comes on at six o'clock, so we want to cut into her business. So okay. let's talk a little bit about um first off, how can they get the book? Um, and then we need to talk about some of us are brave if that's all right. They can get the book through that billionaire's website. They can also go to diasporicafricapress.com. I believe I don't believe it's dot org dot com, but they can mm -hmm. Google it. Uh, ask your local independent bookstore to carry it if they are not carrying it already. What we stood for: the story of a revolutionary black woman by Deborah Jones, uh, co-written by myself, Tonda Cizwe Shimaringa. Okay, right on, right on. So, for some of us are brave. Give us a uh, a uh, a quick understanding of. Um, what it is, the works, because you got volume one and volume two. And I'm gonna invite you back on again. You know what we do. You know, we 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 spent half the uh joint talking that that ish because you be starting trouble. But um <laughs> you ain't learned your lesson at all, brother. But all right. Listen, okay. my, my, my father told me a long time ago, she said he said you just just hard headed. You just won't listen. And my mother used to be like you you talk you talk so much you're gonna make folks hate you. <laughs> Yeah, my so daddy told it other day. so much. I thought that was my name at one point, but she's doing so that one. When my daddy used to call me hard headed, I thought that was my name at one point. Nah, why that's we all call you hard headed? I, I, I'm, I'm really I'm surprised that your father would call you hard headed. Shut up. Shut <laughs> up. Just shut some of us are, some of us are brave. What are we talking about? <laughs> some of us are brave is a compilation of many of the interviews I have done over the years. It is the name of a black women's radio co collector that was here in Los Angeles on KPFA from 2003 to 2011. And unfortunately, fortunately, the name of the, uh, the book is primarily the work that I have done because I kept all of my shows. I documented everything I did. And I believe that that was the type of thing that needed to be out there in the world, documenting black women's views, experiences, etc. That's why we started the radio show, and that's why I thought it would be a good idea to put it into a book. It's it's two volumes because um, when everything was said and done, the pub publisher was like, Tiny, this is more than 450 pages. We can't sell this book. Ain't nobody going to be able to buy it. So we split it in into, into two. Mm -hmm. Primarily interviews I've done. A lot of it, a few of it is also audio that I either recorded myself and played over the air, audio that I was given access to and permission and played over the air or audio I had meant to play on the air and it never got to the air. Mm -hmm. So that's what uh, these two volumes are. It covers a wide variety of sisters. We've got uh, Elaine, speech by Elaine or dressed by Elaine Brown in there. There's Ramona Africa. There's uh, Erica Huggins. There's uh, Asada Shakur. We've got local Panther sisters like Taliba Shakur. We talk about black women in fibroids. We talk about black women and anxiety. There's a transcript from Iyanla Van Zant and Billy Avery in there. Atlanta folks should know who Billy Avery is. She is the founder of the Black Women's Health Project, which eventually became the Black Women's Health Imperative. Um, Pearl Cleage interviewing. Oh, wow. What's my sister's name? I'm, uh, I'm looking at her face and I can't remember it. It was at the National Black Arts Festival one year. I was in Atlanta and I recorded Pearl Cleage interviewing Charlene Hunter Galt on one of her okay. newest books at the time. Sonia Sanchez, an interview I conducted with her, is in there. Mm -hmm. One of the sisters in the collective, S. Pearl Sharp, who is an actress. You might not know her name, but if you saw her face, you'd know her. She talked with Ruby D. That is con uh, contained in the volumes. It's really some good stuff in there. Oh, and of course, for Atlanta folks, Mama Aminata Umoja, okay, uh, okay. member of the New African People's Organization, founder and director of Kilambo School. One of That's the right. pieces that she did years ago is contained in the book also. So a lot of and tell, people, tell, 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 tell them who, who her husband is. Of course, he's been on the platform a couple of times as well. Okay, what's that brother's name? I see his face. Chocolate <laughs> ball headed brother. His name escapes me at the moment. Akinyele Umoja. Hey, hey, hey. I, 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 I would never call AK chocolate ball head brother. That's just 
not what comes out my mouth when, it, when I think of AK. I think a lot of things, but definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> shout, out, shout out to brother Aki Elia Moja, uh, author of uh, Doctor, brother Doctor, Back. Doctor, brother, yeah, brother yeah. Doctor. I don't know what you talk about, chocolate ball head, brother. Anyway. Like, you, just, you just mess up the whole show. But anyway. <laughs> anyway, I injected that into the show. Yeah, Author thank you. We will shoot back. Yes, uh, and we will. <laughs> <laughs> we have been and we will continue to shoot that's back. Right. Absolutely. That's, that's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely, we want folks to go. These three books that she, those four books, including uh, We Will Shoot Back, uh, you should have in your library. Uh, the name of the books, give them the correct titles again, my dear sister. What We Stood For, Story of a Revolutionary Black Woman by Deborah Jones with my assistance. And Some of Us Are Brave, Conversations with Sisters on Life, Art, and Struggle, Volumes 1 and 2. That's right on. That's right on. Speaking of books, I want to plug something that will be coming out, uh, I believe, in October. It's called Revolution in These Times, uh, Black Panther Party veteran Daruba Ben Wahad on anti-fascism, Black liberation and the culture resistance. It is edited by myself with interviews by Dr. Jared Ball. Uh, Kamal Franklin and myself. So um, that is for Black Power Media. So make sure you check that out. That is something that is in the works right about now. So stay tuned for that. Tandy. So, real quick, before we go, about, for Deborah's okay. book, it's a, it, you know, she has a right to tell her story. Her story needs to be told. Her story needs to be known. But we also need to talk about what are the lessons that we can take away. Again, I'm not here to destroy Kwanzaa. I'm not here to save Kwanzaa. It has nothing to do with Kwanzaa as far as, I, as, far as I'm concerned. But what right. we need to talk about is the pitfalls, not of cultural nationalism versus revolutionary nationalism, the pitfalls of the cult of personality, hmm. the pitfalls of, of hero worship, the pitfalls of not listening to your intuition right and on. talking to Black women as well as Black men. Brothers have intuition also. Right and brush it aside a lot. If it don't feel right, it might not be right. Check it out. Right. Listen to your intuition. Your intuition does not mean you harm. Unlike some of these other folks out here. Hmm. It does not mean you harm. Learn to trust in yourself. Right on. Right on. That, that's some jewelry right there. I can't even crack a joke after that, uh, Tandy. I'm feeling like, you know what I'm saying? You just took us to church real quick and just dropped us off. Um, you know, you <laughs> thank, you, thank you for messing my day up. Anyway. So welcome, my brother. Anytime. I'm sure. Anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Well, tomorrow, I want to point out this. We have another bald head brother, and I'm definitely not going to call him chocolate. Was he chocolate? Is he chocolate? Listen, stop it. <laughs> I ain't even gonna eat chocolate no more because of you. Um, 4 p.m. Eastern, tomorrow, Saturday, we have um, our brother Ajamu Baraka. Uh, he was supposed to have been on yesterday, and um, we yeah, had some schedule. He's not chocolate. He might be a little bit caramel, though. Well, listen, I ain't, you he know. kind of caramel. Again, I don't, he, he could be rice bowl if he want to. I just, I don't, <laughs> no offense to, to you all who like that, but and I'm not concerned with whether he's caramel or chocolate, rutabaga or French toast. But anyway, we'll Let's have that brother not get carried away. Let's not get carried away. Four o'clock tomorrow, RSTV. Make sure you stop in for that. We will have another guest on Sunday as well. Um, someone asked, is Sister Lenora Fulani still with us? Uh, she actually made her transition uh, earlier this year. Um, she did? And yes, yes, she transitioned. Oh, Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. You know what? Wrong. I'm sorry. I'm thinking about Viola Plummer. Um, right. Okay. No, okay. I'm not sure about. I'm mm-hmm. not sure about Lenora Fulani. I'm, I'm sorry. So yeah, let me. I'm glad you corrected me on that. Without even correcting me, we realized it. But anyway, um, you know, shout out to all the folks out there that's putting in this critical political work. Um, if you're in the Atlanta area, check out the African Martial Arts Institute. You know what I mean. We can learn a thing or two. Um, organization, FTP movement. We also have political education classes, urban survival preparedness classes, so on and so forth. You know, follow us, check us out, whatever, so on and so forth. We do vet people. Don't think you're just going to roll up in the spot. We don't play that. And, um, you know, we're looking to liberate. It's about organizing, etc. Big Till, I hope you're incorrect saying that 
um, Jackie and Sean's darker than blue show started already. Somebody apologized to me. She gonna think I did that on purpose because she couldn't. We did not last do week. it on purpose. We did not. <laughs> I thought she came on at six o'clock EST. That's my sister. Definitely, when y'all get off here, run and check out our good sister Jackie and brother Sean Darker Than Blue show. I didn't realize they started already. I, that, that is my apologies. I thought they started at six o'clock. But anyway, without further ado, we would like to say have a good night, have a good evening. You know what I'm saying? Continue to support Black Power Media. For those of you, yes, yes, check out what root work. Root work. When is the next root work coming, uh, Tandy? That's a good question. So <laughs> keep watching BPM and you'll find out. That's 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 a damn good answer. So with that in mind, Tandy and I will probably do a uh talking ish on Monday. So we'll let you know about that. I'm just drafting it. I don't give a damn. That's what I do around here. So you know, we'll let y'all know about what's going on that. So um we appreciate you. Also, I have a channel, Riot Starter TV. Make sure you subscribe over there at Riot Starter TV. I have a brand new show that I'll be launching on that side of the fence. It's going to be heavy on the African, a little bit rough. You know what I mean? So I ain't want to jeopardize nobody else over here. So make sure you uh, <laughs> subscribe to at Riot Starter TV. Tandy, love you, sis. Stay on point. Let's keep winning. And um, Thank you, my brother. Love you, too. In spite too, of yourself. I, I knew you was going to say that. So you just won't even, just won't even let it be. Won't even let it be. Thank you, Balagoon, for coming with the peace. Because you know, I was about to set it off. I was about to let him. I was about to tell Balagoon, let him have it, boys. But I, you know, what I'm saying he, he cool. He, he just letting you know we here. Mm. <laughs> anyway, much love to y'all. We appreciate y'all. Salute. Stay on point. Yafu salute, and stay ready for revolution. Till next time, RSTV. Yeah. may appear a confusing blur of activity, each ant doing its own thing, but it can't be. Somehow the ants coordinate their actions so that large insects are overwhelmed, killed and carried back to the base. Pairs is dying and my people are suffering. The money's still low, you should see how they budgeting. Watch what comes out your mouth. People are suffering. It's elementary, they want to smoke on eventually. Pairs is dying, people are suffering. The money's still low, you should see how they budgeting. Pairs is dying, and my people are suffering. Cause the money's still low, they want to smoke on eventually. I swear to God, living in this economy's like a robbery. The government taxing me when they owe me for my property. You niggas act like you happy to live in poverty. When I feel like a king, they gotta make these fools acknowledge me. I'm royalty and loyal to the feeling of it. The contrast make it look thuggish. We talk, walk, and look rugged. Naturally. Nothing sad to see, we all a part of this tragedy I'm mad at you, so why you mad at me? We headed for the times of the nine, watch out six Sun cycle on the rise, moon cycle out the mix Living on this planet of the snakes and the crucifix Pardon self as I onk my way through Marching with my A-boom-boom, boom, making my debut Like great balls of fire, nothing could save you in these replenishing times, I honor my dead Making my ancestors proud when it's off with your head That's my pencil, possess potential to change mental Yes, show what you can in it's packed with the essential less. What is essential? They keep it the sharpest against you. Yes. What is essential? They keep it like a temple. Blast all to the temple, keeping the beat simple and fresh. While they whimper and rest, I'm intuition like the simplest guess. Into tradition, I'm on a mission until a transition to give the up and coming a better existence. I've seen a regular scorn reaching for a point or two. The older we get, it switches up the point of view. And they anointed you, leader of the free world. Desolate minds refined to the B girl. The most benevolent is ever. Who I be, graffiti on the wall, the crew, Drew Ali, Zoo to our key, shifting on the paradigm, raise the vibration, then go prepare the mind. Define magnificent rare gem, dig deep, the omnipotent, all seeing, I just speak the game plan. I pray for niggas, amen. Fat Sharpie, spray can, I'm made man. The suede fans, no street skate, no beat taking. For Pete's sake, he's a beast quaking, the scene shaking. No mistaking, the ants conquer the elephants, FTP, RBG, the rest of them. What's the ant secret that makes them the most efficient predators on Earth? Consuming more meat than lions, tigers, and wolves combined. 
I'm way medicated, puff lion, lace sedated And stay dedicated to culture that created The essence of the lessons now delivered in my presence Kalanji called upon me, so now I pose the question How is it that the blacks came in whips and chains Having nothing else to lose and everything to gain Now niggas entertain for some whips and chains A white dame and some pain Is that shit not strange? It's kinda hard holding down your dreams When you blacking in America with institutions set to bury your six feet Underneath dirt, a debt deep disciples psychological when making those ends meet and needs be a hand fees of other teasers got the thoughts grab the gatlin for good reason in between success devil's greed a pine box of mind jobs and loose and why i come off and camouflage can't say cloth eating lentils and vegetable broth but i ain't never been soft beating the loss of forsaken by any cost bones aching working hard trying to bring home the turkey bacon breaking laws of gravity fuck with the family and watch me savagely crush craniums and chest cavities to pray for the casualties cause my Anatomy is naturally, casually composed This is self-construction for the soul I'm black dynamite, I'll blast you with my nitros Put a dope piece with a gold piece And a book with five disciples We channel and boot mine, the revolution sparker With eight bars, cigar smoke, and some dark room on the altar Watch the dots of work a mojo Walk the stage without a hype main Electric verses turn the great crowd into light rain Flood psyches with an ill beat It's a brain food that's got hot Fly wisdom called Saucy, the enlightener, that's Cyrock 2012 and times are different yet the same Nowadays the number of prisoners behind the cage Outnumber amounts of those enslaved During the trades and shit we killing ourselves Over what set you blame wow. Getting shot instead of hang Nothing changed nah. but a better except the cheddar Of corporate profit to gain The more money in pocket, what? the more people in change right. Unite niggas who bang, what destroy their main aim It's all connected from a web like a Nazi It's the people, Siapu is the army Start a top contender for your plot to new agenda They even read on the track, sucker and for dinner. All that got me job pinning, this right cheers the ending. Words the venom, getting them wrapped in Egyptian linen. Come in for head this rapper, Kali will shake the rafters. Only thing standing after, walking natural disaster. Rapture.